Hello everybody and welcome to Geopolitics with WSD. Today we're revisiting France and France is just oh so fun. I've got Justin here co-hosting and interviewing once again, followed by somebody who's getting his credentials as an interviewer because he's wanting to do a couple of episodes when we get to Southeast Asia or South Asia. Radif, say hello. Yo, how's it going guys? All right, so it's good to see everyone here. And uh, we're going to start off with the normal thing. Justin, do you have the questions? Yes, I do. I am prepared. Fantastic. So before we get into that, just a quick quick thing here. Justin, are you doing are you doing good? Is everything going well for you? Um, you know, I was having a tough time a few days ago, but I just decided that uh, you know, my my sadness and despair with the world was just a social construct, and I just ignored it and decided <laughs> that I'm happy again. And uh, that's going pretty good so far. Like, just deciding that I'm not sad anymore has really worked. Like, I, I suggest everyone do this. Clearly the best mental health advice anyone's ever gotten, ever. Right. So, Radif, introduce yourself a little bit. Why should people listen to you whenever they, they hear you interviewing? Hey, how's it going? My name's Radif. Um, since I wasn't asked how my day was going, I'm not going to answer that question. Um <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, while well, you should listen to me, um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of familiar with a lot of foreign policy and what the effects of big uh, nations and intervention is. Um, my family and I have experienced war and intervention to the extreme, and I, um, I'm, I have quite a good handle on foreign policy because of it. Care to give any details of what that was, or you want to keep that below the door? Um, I mean, I could give a little bit of details on uh, what, well, who my father fighted for, as far as the Second Chechnya War goes. But um, I could also talk about um, our, you know, uh, kind of desecration of Grozny. I could go into detail about that, but that's like. It's not really kid friendly. Or... No, it's not. But this isn't a podcast for kids. But that's just the big one I wanted to get to get out of this. That you were actually from Chechnya. So, all okay. right. Without further ado, so what is the first question for France? Alrighty. So our first question of the day is: How did France enter the modern era? Okay. So remember how I had that long conversation about like how Russia got to the modern era. Yeah, France is long as hell, right? So, uh -huh. I actually had this chat earlier today, I think. Uh, just, like, giving a quick synopsis, or it was either the other day. Yeah, it was yesterday. Anyway, so French history is really, really long. Uh, because, like, what is the amalgamation of France is a couple of different things. So, France, a long, long time ago, used to be a Celtic place called Gaul. And this is uh, basically the area where Julius Caesar rolled into. These people were Celts, and they were Latinized by the Romans. And this would... Justin took off. Okay. Um, this would be largely uh, colonized and conquered by the the Latins or the Romans, and it would be turned into uh, basically a full Roman province, although they weren't seen as Romans. They were still the Gauls, but they weren't Gallic, or they were or more particular... They were Gallic, but they weren't. Um, they were no longer Celts to a large degree. They had Latinized. Um, what happens after this is that when the Roman Empire starts to fall, and this is the death of a thousand cuts, is that the Germans invade. And these are not the Germans that we think of today. Uh, these are different Germanic peoples that are uh, coming across the Rhine. And the particular group of people that we're talking about right now is the Franks. You might notice a simple name here, right? The Franks roll in here and they basically do their own level of like colonization and conquering or what have you. And they basically turn the area into what will eventually become modern France. This is a long story. It's not easy, right? Like we can talk about the difference between the the core of the Italie de France, which is, um, or Italie de France, which is the area around Paris. And that is like where the core of what the, the, the Franks will build out around. And these are... If you want the leaders, this is the Merovingians. This is Clovis. This is, um, um, there's a few other in there. I'm, I, I tend to get the um, Carlings mixed in with them a little bit too often. So I'm going to leave that at the door. Anyway, what happens is, is that 
they come in and they basically bring their own at, or affluence into the region. And because of that, they'll mix with the, the, the Gallic peoples and they will become what is modern French. It'll take some time, but it'll happen. And uh, you'll have people like the Merovingians build out what we think of as, Mer- as modern France. It will largely get to that size. However, his France is incredibly unlucky. He has a lot of, um, a lot of ebbs and flows when it comes to its history. So let's like run through this real quick. You have the Merovingians. The Merovingians kind of uh, die out, and they they get to a point where they're ineffective. And then you have the Carlings, and the Carlings are people like Charlemagne and Charles the Hammer. These are the people that are famous for you know being French. They're not truly French though. They're still kind of Germanic. Um, or more Germanic in their actual approach. But um, whenever that's this is all going on, Charlemagne will make an empire that is half of Germany, all of France, and most of Italy. Uh, he'll form the, the Papal States, uh, or he'll help form the Papacy and the Papal States, uh, where that is given to the Pope. And um, basically what happens is that his grandkids, the empire gets divided on. The western part of the empire will be known as West Franca, and it will initially become France. This is more of like an ethno-French core that that is, that is largely built around. This is largely the subjugation of Aquitaine as a, or the Frenchifying of them. Meanwhile, the middle, uh, the middle part is Middle Francia that'll be Lotharingia, and it will basically fall apart within short order. Um, the, the geopolitical borders of it were really bad. It, the ruler will basically be forced into Italy and give up most of the central parts of the empire in between France and uh, Germany. And then we get into the German part, which will eventually be known as the Holy Roman Empire uh, 200 years later, is that East Francia becomes basically a Germanic uh, kingdom that is <clears throat> largely unified by that ethnocentric core. And where there's a long history with the... Uh, Holy Roman Empire, I'm not going to go down that one because that's its own history. That's when we'll talk about Germany. But it becomes a massive geopolitical force and it will eventually in, or take over most of Lotharingia and even most of Italy and become the great Holy Roman Empire under Otto I. So, let's move back to France. The The, the state that comes out from Charlemagne's grandkid that is West Francia is France. It is the exact same civilizational government that has lasted to this day. Now, granted, there has been revolutions, there has been, like, the toppling of those governments, but the lineage directly is that, is that whenever somebody overthrows that government and comes in with a new one, it will take over the exact land masses and the exact peoples that comes before it. That That is now what we think of as France from here on out. And remind you, this is literally in the 900s. So France is not young by any stretch of the imagination. We haven't even gotten to the point where I started Russian history yet. Like, this is before... This is, like, right around the Kievan Rus starting. Anyway, so... What is France... How, how do we jump from there to, to modern France? Well, basically, France will be in a geopolitical struggle against most of its neighbors, particularly... At first, it'll be the Holy Roman Empire, then it will be um Spain and then it will be England and it will it'll they'll literally just rotate them around the clock and they'll they'll actually fight off like two or three at the same time. Um uh, basically as soon as the Holy Roman Empire really starts going to crap, you have England start being a um a real problem for them and this will eventually be the Anglican Empire, which is, you know, uh King was it Henry the Second, if I remember correctly, where they'll own half of France. And so England will eat away at quite a bit of France. Um, this will largely be uh, turned the other way in the Hundred Years' War. That's Joan of Arc at the very end of it, in the, in the last phase. I believe that's the Edwardian phase, but I can't remember for sure. It's not really a Hundred Years of War. It's about 111 years of three or four different phases of war. Um, but anyway, to, to consolidate that into its own thing... As soon as France really puts itself back together from taking over what England had taken away, they start licking their wounds and putting themselves together, and they're still fending off what is the Holy Roman Empire, although it's kind of going in a breakdown at this point, and then Spain forms. (laughs) And, you know, the thing about Spain 
is that it doesn't directly challenge uh, France. France will largely, or Spain will largely go into Mexico and the the Incan Empire and whatnot. Um, and they'll, they'll become extraordinarily lynched off of that. And of course you have the Spanish Armada that tries to butchwhack England here in the 1500s, which is where we're at. France is largely penned. They can't go eat. They can't go east because the Holy Roman Empire, while is kind of falling apart, is still there. Uh, they can't go north, and they can't really get any really good colonies because they're challenging the English at every diamond measure. Uh, although this is this won't really take up until the 1600s, and then you have Spain, which is already in the New World, has already beaten them in most of South America uh, and and Latin America, so the French really can't compete there. So. What tends to happen here is literally everything just goes wrong, right? So the moment that that France really starts to see an opening where maybe they could get above uh, or and go around England, Spain becomes uh, ruled by the Habsburgs, which is part of the people who rule the Holy Roman Empire. And this is where the Austrians really start taking control of, of the Holy Roman Empire. What is made worse is that is it. In, 15, in the early 1500s, and I can't think if it's like 1513 or like 1526. I'd have to double check this. The king of Hungary and and Bohemia died. And their closest inherit, inheritor was the Archduke of Austria. And so Austria goes from being a relatively sizable principality in the Holy Roman Empire to being an empire itself. But because it had fragmented to such a degree the Austrians are effectively elected emperor every time now. And now Germany, as we think of it today, is actually two massive empires, the Empire of Austria and the Empire of the Holy Roman, or the Holy Roman Empire. And they coalesce together into this semi-integrated political institution that uh, the, the French are just, they can't overcome. Because anytime they invade the Holy Roman Empire, Austria comes to their defense. France can't expand. What's made worse is that towards the later 1500s is that one of the one of the Austrian princes, which is a Habsburg, will eventually get on the throne of of, uh, of Spain, and this is of course Charles V. He is will eventually become not only ruler of Spain but Holy Roman Emperor himself, which means Spain and Austria are now in a massive massive geopolitical uh, familial alliance that absolutely hems in France. Now, this will eventually get into where, where we think of as the Thirty Years' War. This is the, the whole, you know, Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation thing, and shortly after that, France does make a good show of itself here. It will fight, it will lose, but it will literally beat the door in for the Holy Roman Empire in Spain. They'll challenge Charles V, and they, they won't win, but they will do a lot of damage to him. And a couple of years later, Sweden will get Prussia to flip, Sides and Sweden and Prussia will basically come in, and in the Thirty Years' War, or in the Thirty Years' War, in German and Protestantized Northern Germany. Okay, why does this matter for France? Well, it basically kind of breaks the deadlock. It gives France possible allies to deal with, whether it be Sweden or being what will eventually form into the uh, Duchy of Brandenburg, Prussia, which is really starting to only now starting to really get its footing. Fast forward into this, this is the real time that French colonialization takes off, and this will go out throughout the 1600s. They'll, they'll be trading barbs. Yeah, they'll be trading barbs a lot with Spain will largely, I'm sorry, excuse me. They'll trade a lot of barbs with the Germans and the Italians as part of the Holy Roman Empire, but Italy will be eventually be forced out of the empire because of uh, some level of Italian nationalism, and basically the French will wrench it out. And they'll have a series of successor states in Italy that is like Piedmont, Sardinia, the Papal States, Naples, or the two Sicilies, depending on what time we're talking about. Um, and we'll get into Venice and uh, Lombardy and whatnot. So France is able to do that. Spain will eventually go its own way whenever they don't have a Habsburg ruler, which gets them off of their back. And thus... France is now just one-on-one -on -one Holy Roman Empire, but at the same time, they're now dealing with the English again. This is the era of their massive colonialization. This is New France. This is Quebec. This is Haiti. And it will all culminate into the war that we know as... Okay, there's numerous names here. The first part of this is the War of Austrian Secession. The second part of this is what we know as the Seven Years' War. It's all really one conflict split apart into two. 
the Austria the War of Austrian Succession is basically um, a French or I'm sorry not French an, a woman comes to the to the throne in Austria but she's not allowed to be Holy Roman Empire because that's not the rule the rules are it has to be a male she eventually politically maneuvers herself into changing the law so she can be but this guy named Frederick the Great of Prussia decides that he's going to take that political instability and he's going to try to seize land in the Holy Roman Empire. And long story short, he does. He seizes Silesia, which is, this is not France, but it, it changes the geopolitical game. France is able to get in on this and they're able to not make gains, but they're able to put their influence further into the region that they, that they are wanting to. Second round of this to go goes to hell for the French. The French, the Austrians, and the Russians are all allied against Prussia in, on the continent. And it's really France versus England everywhere else. This is particularly in North America. Anyway, make a long story short with what happens here is that France will do a well against the, um, against the Prussians. But it will largely be the Austrians and the Russians fighting them. The French largely will try to fight the English, particularly in India, and they will try particularly fight them in North America. They will lose horribly, which is which is ironic because they'll still keep their like their navy. But in the the long and the short here is that France will lose all, if not most, of its North American colonies. They're literally, after this war, they'll only have Haiti. They'll get a little bit back later under Napoleon. We'll leave that at the door. But for a while, they are booted off of North America entirely. And all their concessions either go to Spain or France. Or, I'm sorry, uh, or England, which is almost Britain now. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a lot of history. <laughs> They lose most of their, any of their gains in India, and they're only left with, like, a little sliver, and they, they'll never really go into India from this point again. So they've lost their real na naval competitive edge, right? This is the end of, uh, of the French overseas empire to a large degree. They'll, they'll be able to do it here and there, but it's basically on reboot from this point on, and the, the English will largely steamroll them from this point on. So let's fast forward to the nice part. They'll get revenge with the American Revolution. They'll sponsor us where we break away. They will openly go into what is my friend refers to as the European Civil War, which is the Napoleonic and French Revolutionary Wars, which is basically their geopolitical bid to conquer the continent. The problem with this is they should have won. But where Napoleon was a military and administrative genius, he was not... No, no, France did not keep Quebec. I'm actually, sorry, reading chat. Uh, they had to give it over to, the, to England, and this will actually be the the English Dominion of Canada from the War of 18, or from the War of, the Seven Years' War, excuse me. They call it Queen Anne's War. But anyway, from the Seven Years' War words on is that Quebec will actually be ruled by, the, by English. And it, that's why there's so much division, is that there's these ethno-linguistically French people that live in Canada and they were to such a high degree that they never assimilated into the, uh, Canada proper because there was just more of them. Anyway, let's roll that clock back to where we were. So, French Revolutionary Wars happen. Napoleon. Say what you will about Napoleon. He is a military and administrative genius. He understands how to bring up cannons in a whole new way and is able to punch on Austria and France and Britain and Prussia in ways that no one thought possible. Even the Prussians, the mighty space marines of Prussia, are getting rickrolled by these guys. Um, and the granted, part of this was that they lost most of their age-old commanders. A lot of them had died just previously, and a lot of their good kings had died previously, and they were in a whole new generation of people that were just coming up when this happens. So France is really powerful, but there's one thing they didn't have in Napoleon. And that was a political genius. Napoleon just wanted to simply be another emperor among the the emperors of of uh, Europe. He wanted to be in the same way that there was an Austrian emperor and a Russian emperor. He wanted to be the emperor of France. The problem is it was a bit of a it was a bit old fashioned. And I'm sorry, but if you fight the Austrians three times, defeat them. Um. You, you kind of would think destroy Austria and 
there was people who would have been better for this role of saying, hey, look, we, we, we fought Austria twice. It's not working for us. What we're doing, we have to do a new thing. And this is the era, this is the very earliest phases of nationalism, right? Well, what we would con- consider the nationalistic age, where Germans were thinking of themselves as German, as in Hungarians were thinking of themselves as Hungarians. Uh, the old titles of nobility didn't mean as much because we were a people together. There was already times of this here and now. And actually, the French Revolution is what kind of starts this and it spreads the ideas of liberalism across the continent. If somebody had the foresight or if Napoleon had had the foresight to go, look, it's a new era. I'm not going to be the emperor. I'm going to be the chief of the state of France. And we're going to ethnically divide out all of these different lands like he hid with the the Batavian Republic or the Confederation of the Rhine. It probably would have worked for him. He probably could have made a very good ally in Hungary, but he never made it independent Hungary and he never took apart the, the Austrian Empire and it would eventually cost him. We can talk about, yes, invading Russia or whatever, but I, I don't think that was his real flaw here, is that every time, that as soon, he basically forced everybody into complacency, and the problem here is that literally every time that he would suffer a major defeat, everyone would flip sides and join a war against him. He would not systematically destroy the war, the European order, and that's what he really had to do, and that he did not have the political... Um, foresight or the political in- intuitiveness to actually do this and that would probably be the end of the french revolutionary wars and napoleon himself and eventually he'll be um exiled to saint helena and all that so getting very close to modern france france will get a series of rulers and republics this is there there literally is like three revolutions that will happen here in the next 50 years and you'll have a, a return of an empire, you'll have another republic, you'll have another empire. It's, it gets ridiculous. The French will try again with overseas empire. They they got a little bit of it back with Louisiana under Napoleon. Napoleon sells Louisiana to um, to the Americans, right? This is the Louisiana Purchase under Thomas Jefferson. There, There's the context for that. And then skipping back to these, this trade-off period is that the French will go into Africa, then into Algiers, Tunisia... Uh, Morocco and colonize that. They'll eventually go under Napoleon the third, which is nothing like his uncle all the way off into um, French Indonesia or what will be a French Indonesia. So they don't sit there and tr- just bleed. They do try to do stuff. The problem is, is that they either just don't seem to ante up to their rivals in the way that they, they could. Uh, the English will always super, supersede them in naval capacity all the way from the seven years war after. And so we, they are used, able to use their Navy to help us in the French and I'm sorry, to the American revolution, but it was literally just an outfoxing thing with it. We just, they got them, the British Navy out of position and they were just able to do it long enough where we won the battle of York town. Hooray. Most of that is not the norm for the, through French history at, at that point though, from, Basically, after the Seven Years' War, they will lose most of their naval engagements to the British. And um, they will basically lose on the naval front. So they only have the land front. After Napoleon, the French lick their wounds and they try to figure out what to do. There's not a lot of uh, gravitas to really pick a fight with the European power. This is known as the Concert of Europe, um, where there's largely peace on the continent. However, the problem... That will um, that will really kind of hurt them is that there is better leadership in another country called Prussia. And this will be the culmination of an Otto von Bismarck and a Frederick Mulkey. Bismarck is a administrative and political genius. And Mulkey is a military genius. Together, these two will be able to unite Germany in five years. Prussia wasn't small, don't get me wrong. But in, within five years, they'll able... They, particularly Bismarck, will politically maneuver Europe into letting Germany, the German Empire, form. And when it does, it completely reshapes the the future of the continent. Germany together is as strong as France is twice over. It is not a pretty sight for the French. And from that point on, France will be largely relegated to third or fourth place on the continent for the next 150 years until today. So I'm going to skip, right? This is... They'll make pretty good... 
uh, efforts of showing themselves in World War One, but they will believe themselves white. In World War Two, they're conquered in six weeks. They'll be liberated by the Allies. And then the last vestige hurrah that they have is that they, they participate in the Suez Crisis with the British in 1956. And what really goes wrong for them here is that um, they're not able to make an alliance with the British to be like a third sphere of power on the planet. And the Americans will basically force them into subservience where they have to get rid of their colonies. And they're now a part of the full NATO pact, which they were already technically were signed on to. But the Americans just tell them, hey, look, either you're doing exactly what we tell you to or you are going to have to fend f from the Soviets yourselves. That conversation lasted a week. So long story short, the Cold War eventually gets over. We're at the France of today, which is built, had built out the EU. EU was originally a French doctorate or I'm sorry, a French creation, but the Germans have largely been able to take it away from them. And so we're here. France is relatively the second most powerful nation in Europe right now, but it has problems. One, it's having a political re a political uh, reshuffling right now. Two, its geopolitics is actually probably the best in the region, but it's tied itself to this institution, these various institutions that do not serve French interests. The EU does not help France in any real way. Let's just be honest here. Um, being in NATO does not allow them to geopolitically reach out without the Americans getting pissed off. And so while they have a decently competent military, while they have an economy that could be better but is not horrible, and while they have a political institution that is in the process of re reevaluating itself, modern France is in a really interesting situation. It has a lot of doors it can open, but it can't open all of them. And so it's going to have to ch make choices really soon about what direction it's going. Congratulations, we're caught up on the history. What are my follow-up questions? <laughs> okay. Um, wow. <laughs> so, I think my first question would be, when you look at France entering today, um, you know, France, with their history, has this large and vast uh, back and forth of shuffling political landscape, and now you're seeing that again with uh, their political system kind of or their main political uh, institutions kind of like collapsing, not really collapsing, but those parties collapsing and that reshuffle happening. Uh, do you think this is just like a, a French issue? Like they just have trouble keeping a political, uh, you know, uh, system in place for a long time? Or why do you think this is continually happening to France? Seemingly more than most other nations. That's a great question. So I'm not a super Omega expert on France. I really would like to be. But there's some holes and gaps that I definitely have that I that allows that does not allow me to understand the French the way that I probably would like to. So disclaimer out of the way, I would call myself like an intermediate level or maybe an advanced level like expert on this, but not a, like a, a full maxed out level expert, right? So this is my take with what I see uh, from a more intermediate level is that the French have some kind of weird thought process about how you do civics it's not it's not a hardly a bad thing most french people care and the last that i checked their voter turnouts are always ridiculously high french people give a crap now in good reasons is that everyone participates and that everyone does largely have their voice heard they were like usually the leaders in every kind of liberal institution on the planet whether it was women voting or different races voting or um, unlanded people voting, that kind of thing. The French usually were in the top three people to do it, if not let it personally. The bad news here is that it get, it's super volatile, right? There's a joke among people in geopolitics that, you know, the, the, the hobbyist of the average Parisian, people living in Paris, is to ride on the weekends. <laughs> um and uh, unironically, that's not much of a joke. It's really a, a kind of serious is that the French people are very volatile. And they the problem that this has led to, that this can lead to, is that any time anything happens, basically people get in the streets and they voice themselves. And whether that works or not, I'll leave to your interpretation. However, it, it has gotten to times where the French actually shoot themselves in the foot. Great example is actually right when World War II starts. 
the French are having a political, I don't know what to put this. They're, they're basically politically like ripping themselves apart at the seams. The, the far left is very, very strong in France at this time. And the far right's getting pretty powerful here too, but it's nowhere near as uh, malevolent as the Nazis are. But you have a lot of everything from the far left to the far right in France. Their political institutions are strained because no one can agree on jack shit. Because you've got literal communists, French communists, which were popular, at the same time as you have social democrats and Christian conservatives and like what we would call fascists all vying for political power. And no one can get a strong lead here. You'll have largely what is some kind of like social democrat in charge, but what tends to be the case is that they have very slim majorities and not a lot of people are always happy with them. This will lead to literally political breakdown and atrophy where the military largely just takes the weekends off. It's not politically unified because there's just not a common, um, there's not like a common battle cry among the French people like there was in World War One, and so. If this wasn't the case, French probably the French probably could have fought the Germans off a lot more handily. But literally, from everything from their political, military, and economic structures were not cooperating in any kind of way that is what we speak of, what we expect of a na- nation state. It is very much in an area, a an era of civil strife, and we're kind of seeing that now here in the in the modern day France right now is that their systems are coming apart. And there's no one who agrees enough to put enough political, economic, and military power in France to really say, I'm in charge, this is what's happening, and this is where we're going. I fully expect that Macron will lose the next election. I could be wrong, but I don't think that's going to be the norm. It's that France is just in one of these areas or eras to where they're pulling themselves apart. Now, the question was largely, and I'm sorry that I'm like elaborating on this, but you asked why can't exactly say it's almost like a french national spirit is that everyone gets their voice and because of that they can't agree on anything it's kind of like the, what we're having in the problem here in the united states a little bit is that before the internet it was the elites that largely spoke and you largely heard from the people who understood what was going on about what issues of the day but the thing about the United States here, and I'm just doing this as a comparison and contrast, is that you have progressives from Portland, Oregon, who are setting the place on fire, and the radical right, you know, Trumpist crowd, all have their own voice. And they're all pushing the political system and pulling it in certain directions. And no one can really egg- eke out which direction it's going to go. No one has made an agreement here. So until somebody went through basically what will probably happen here is sheer force of nature and personality cements what will be the future of the Democratic Party and the future of the Republican Party, the French have the same issue. Except usually whenever it happens, they get to the point where it's very close to civil war. But instead of civil war, it's civil strife. We've seen that with the Yellow Jackets. We've seen that with uh, a lot during the Macron presidency is that there's almost a riot every weekend, if not a legitimate like cause for concern. Will this end for France? Sooner or later, yes. But it's going to co- it's gonna take a complete shift in their political system t- for that to happen, and they're not really there yet. So, next question. Or follow-up. Okay. Um, that, le- that leaves me with a second question. Uh, I'll, I'll ask one real quick, and then you can take over. Um, quick question about France. Uh, you talked about how right now they have a lot of doors open or put doors that they could open, mm-hmm. uh, particularly by reaching out and, you know, getting involved in the world outside of just French territory. Um, what types of activities is France currently undertaking that you see being beneficial that they're already kind of like poking their head through the door at this point? That's a great question. So the French never really gave up on their empire like, um, like the British did. Now, the, this was a political gambit. They didn't want to basically can't complete control of the Americans. And whether you want to say this is a good or bad thing, and it was probably bad for most of the people that participated, is that a lot of the former French colonies still use a, a currency that is either French-derived or is the... Uh, I'm sorry, it is a French-derived currency. Basically, the French control how much of it, of it is there is, where it can work, and they're all kind of like this former French col- commonwealth. 
Take that on top of the fact that the the French Foreign Legion has now been involved in military conflicts in the former uh, colonial possessions, particularly Mali, and they're actively engaging in ways that is almost neo imperial. The France is really, really well positioned to survive the world that is coming, because they already have a few doors open that no one else even has a chance to open. So, on that regard. They have places where they can get their natural resources for natural resources that they don't have, like oil at home. They have places that they can go and take a stop by and get some. Algeria being one of them, and they actually have somewhat, if you will, good relations with their former colonies. So, the long story short here is that they're already pretty well positioned for a neo imperial world. It's not exactly a bad thing for the French. They just actually have to have a good leader in, in Paris that actually knows what the hell they're doing. All right. Uh, right. If you got any questions, ask away. All right. So um, I you kind of covered a little bit of what I was going to ask, but it was about the, Fr uh, the French Foreign Legion. Mm -hmm. And in the last few years, some of the more recent conflicts that they have served in is Afghanistan, Cote d'Ivoire, and Chad. These are all former French colonies, or were play still play a role in France, right? Do you think that uh, a new age of imperialism might find France retaking Western Africa and um, many of their colonies in, in South America back? I think the French will have to give up on South America unless for some reason the French can't, or I'm sorry, the Americans cannot enforce the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, that really gets into a question of if China is going to play a part because China is playing investments, particularly in Central and South America. Different conversation there entirely. I apologize. But what basically is that, will there be a situation where, where France can get into places like South America? Probably not. French Guiana is probably largely where they're hard capped out. What they can do and what is really in their interest and what they will do is they'll probably go back to West Africa. Uh, whether it is former colonies like Algeria that has oil that they need or if they can go into some of the places that they have better ties with, such as uh, I believe it's like Cameroon that has certain resources like um, uh, I am, I'm sorry, I'm blanking here. There's certain, there's Almost everything that they need is in the former French colonies at some point or another. And if it's not, they are in the best position to actually get at it. The French aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle isn't very good, but their navy is actually pretty solid. I would say it's actually better than the, than the British one right now. Don't tell the British I said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but here's the real thing that I actually want to make a point out. Is that when it comes to the French Foreign Legion... They're doing what most other NATO countries aren't doing. It's, a, it's outside the Americans. They're getting battle practice. So their commanders and their NCOs actually have been in a firefight. And they know how to actually engage and discipline troops to understand and deal with that. Germany has no idea. Poland has no idea. Turkey just got its first taste with um, the uh, Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict. Uh, yeah, that and uh, Kurdistan. Sure. Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah, France has actually had for the last 20 years at least people in their military that have been cycled in and out of these conflict zones that is getting them practice. So unlike most of any other Western nation, they have a officer corps and an enlisted corps that has an idea of how war actually works. And so it'll be very interesting to see what happens if they act to take a military option. They could do it. Okay, so I have a follow-up question. Yep. Um, so when we talk about France, we've seen with the rise of... Um, as we see with the rise of far extremist uh, Islamic movements like ISIS, and um, I'm really blanking on names right now, uh, but Boko Haram is actually a really good example of um, an Islamic movement affecting a uh, former former french colony right with with the rise of uh god man I'm doing bad. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> okay. with the rise with it of uh islamic extremism uh do you see a way that france could retain a fraternite um policy of you know reclaiming their former territories and become an imperial 
power like they used to be uh, in in the future if they're driven far right enough that is a great question um there's a level where there's a yes and there's a level where there's a no so does the rise of radical islam give a certain challenge to france to the french yes however you got to remind yourself that the what we're used to that enables terrorism will probably not be the case anymore because you need this very specific set of circumstances to allow for terror states i'll put it this way you usually need a place where the government is weak enough that they can't control the entire area but also not comp so weak that the people who live there are basically forced into self-rule i'll give you as an example for this is pakistan i think this is the most shining example Around Islamabad, around the urban cores, Pakistan exists in a strong, sovereign uh, political entity. But if you get off to the borders of Afghanistan, it has no political, economic, or military infrastructure to patrol those areas. And thus, this is places where you get people like Osama bin Laden and the Taliban and whatnot, who are able to take get into these areas basically fester in there and then go about in the rest of the world and screw with everybody that is probably coming to an end because with so, it with a nero imperial world what you're very likely to see is that either you will have very strong nation states like a french empire come in and literally just kick your ass or you're literally going to see areas where these terror states no longer have the luxury of being able to not ignore their local areas. They have to govern it themselves. So go ahead. Okay. So, um, I, I will say, I will say with, with France being uh, low on uh, oil, I do find it extremely likely they will expand and maybe try to reclaim their territories. Now, when we talk about Indonesia and French Indochina and um, Western Africa, do you think it's likely that these country, these um, areas are going to oh, welcome them with open arms? Or do you see it maybe more as a resistance kind of thing? Or do you think it's a mix of both? I don't expect... Oh, so, can you please elaborate where and how that would play out? Sure. Sorry for cutting you off. No, it's not a problem. I don't see the French going, trying to go back to Indochina or like anything past India. What I largely see them going after is Africa, particularly Algeria. And honestly, while not a former French colony, I think they will probably screw with um, Nigeria quite a bit too. Uh, these are the two main eight, uh, oil exporting areas. And if they want to cut their competition out of oil, that's where they want to go. Not alone to cut them out, but also to get their own. The French are really weird because there's times where they play with a heavy hand, but there's plenty of times, particularly in North American history, where they play with a very light hand and they have like puppet rulers and people that you wouldn't really think are an actual French representative, but kind of operate in that regard. I can't say definitively which path France will go. They'll probably do a bit of both. At least that's been their national, like, um, modus operandi for a very very long time is that they are firm believers in the carrot and the stick if they think they can get you somewhere with a carrot they'll put you up as puppet king they'll let you rule your own thing uh, you know pretty much hands off as long as you uh, follow whatever rules and minutia that they set apart but if you don't or if they just think that you're going to be a pain in the ass from the start they'll come in and carpet bomb Okay, so um, kind of connected to that, we you kind of mentioned the Na uh, NATO earlier and their problems with NATO and expanding while they are still in NATO. NATO. Um, with the Chinese threat at gloom and Russia not getting any better, do you think that France will leave NATO anytime soon to seek new territories in, in Africa? Or do you think they will stay and stay with its status quo until the storm is cleared. What I what I expect is that there's two major things that are going to happen relatively at the same time. Uh, number one, when it comes to NATO, is that NATO is largely run by the Americans, and we're starting to see now that most country, or at least a, a large portion of the countries that matter in NATO, don't want to be a part of it. The Tur no one wants the Turks in NATO, and even the Turks probably don't want to be in it themselves. 
and they are the second or third biggest military in NATO. France is the same situation. They're either the second or third. I can't remember which one was bigger. But they're clearly not very interested in NATO. They they actually are making signs, or at least under the Macron government, that they'd rather have a United European Union army at this point, uh, where basically it's run by the Germans and the French together. That's making a lot of political um, hay in Paris right now, and it will probably get the Macron gut or one of the big issues that will get the Macron government ejected from office. Um, I, what I eventually see is that NATO will and the European union will fall apart under this right uh, rise of nationalism that has uh, started out because of uh, various different reasons, but particularly with COVID. Okay. When that, when so, that eventually happens, you'll largely see within the span of a year or two, NATO will largely just become defunct. If the Americans, especially if the Americans decide that they don't want to fund it anymore. Okay, so a few things I want to talk about um, when we talk about France and the rise of nationalism. The rise of nationalism is we are nothing. Sure. France, right? Uh, uh, I, I think Le National is actually getting to a point where they will probably actually be the ones to win the next election. But this is getting no, into the no, yeah, 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 but but when we when we talk, could you could you possibly credit those rise of rises of nationalism? And I don't know if you're familiar with the term fraternité. Mm-hmm. But what it means, what it means is you know reclaiming territories in both outside of French uh, territories and and within Europe as well reclaiming some of French territories within Europe. Do you think this will manifest? And if so, do you think will possibly maybe the uh, fall of Eastern Europe trigger it? Or I'm not, you... I'm not sure. And you know, chat's wanting to fight with you on this one. I, I, I don't. Um, what do they want me? What do they want to fight with me? The, it said fraternity means brotherhood, which um, I'm pretty sure they're right. Um, no, it does. It does. But the, the actual term itself means the re- like, you know, it, it manifest it's destiny the, kind of thing. Right. It's manifest <laughs> destiny and it's Russia and it's France return retaining their former glory, kind of like the U.S. is having. Right. But so I, I can't right. speak. No, you're fine. I can't speak exactly the, how NATO or the European Union is going to fall apart. I definitely think a rise in nationalism is going to tear is going to be part of what rips the seams apart. But I have yet to see what the final death knell is. What I do think is going to happen is one thing is going to happen, like a banking system collapse in another country, which leads to another thing, which leads to another thing, and we'll largely watch the system like fall apart over two years. Um, but that gets into the future. Let's try to stay off of that. I think the next section is geo is the actual geopolitics or the geography. Do we want to go there? Mm-hmm. Or does anyone have any like um, anyone have any uh, further questions? Because we're at forty-seven minutes already. Yeah, no, nah, I think we're <laughs> good to move on. <laughs> actually, actually, I want to ask one thing about domestic policy of France. Okay. Nothing to do with geopolitics. Actually, it has a little bit. So, France has obviously had an influx of immigration mm-hmm. as of recently from North Africa. What 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 are the what are the effects of the these new migrants? on on French politics. Okay, so I'm going to say this up as a big I don't know. And the big reason I don't know is because it is constitutionally illegal to collect ethnic data. And actually, it's not any ethnic, but I believe it's ethnic religious data on people. You cannot ask them what their race is. You cannot ask them what their religion is. It is outlawed by the French constitution. So when it comes to their voter rolls, it doesn't say whether you're French white or, you know, um, an immigrant from whatever. So we don't have any data on like, if there's a political divide here or whatever, Uh, it's a shot in the dark. I literally just can't speak to it. So I am sorry, but I don't know. And I have to confess that. I'm sorry to let you down. No, it's I'm fine. sorry to let you down with such a horrible question. That's no, it's a great, a it's a great question. There's so many people in the industry that I know who are begging to want to answer that question, but they can't. There's just they don't have the ability to. Okay, because I know it's caused a lot of problems with Germany, and Germany has actually had a few terror attacks and on these illegal immigration sites, both from the far right and from uh, Islamic extremists. <laughs> so it's it's kind of a whole hectic situation. Uh, I know France isn't as bad as Turkey or Germany or Hungary is, but I know they're still kind of in a bad boat. 
or is France is France has always had a better race relationship with with any on any given level than almost anybody else. Um, it, it's not only in the former colonies that they had, but it's also been their domestic policy as well. Is that they were all they have at least by whether this is French propaganda or not, I can't really tell you, but the general <laughs> the general theme that they've had is that they've always been a far more um, quality to people who were not ethnically French, unless you were German, but that's all other conversation. But particularly the mm-hmm. uh, like black minorities that would live in France, almost everyone that I have ever talked to says that they have been treated better than in any other Western nation by a country mile. Not saying it's been perfect, but they minorities are, have a completely different set of circumstances they have to live in France. Now, I will also say that I know there are plenty of people that are more of the traditional right in France that do not like immigration, do not like all these people. They're ethnonats, right? They they don't want them in France. I can't tell you how big that is, but I would not be surprised if that is part of the Lena- national camp or um front is that I would not be surprised if that is not part of their voter base is that basically France for the French people. So Tiberius, have you ever been to France? Not personally. I've okay. Well, I will, I will share on my visit. How about we uh, save that for the after show? No, 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 no. But this is, this actually has stuff to do with the, the immigration. Um, as far as immigration goes, there is, there is a sizable uh, Western African population within France. I believe um, that. And although although there isn't as many North Africans as there are in Italy, I think I think uh, there is a massive, massive, massive um, West, Western African population. Now I think the difference here is that they've they've actually been around for long enough, you know, to the point where it's the, their neighborhoods are not segregated, which is good. And they're not redlined in a way, so. When when I when I walk into a neighbor one neighborhood versus another, right? I don't really feel this at least in at least in Paris or Bordeaux. I didn't really feel a wealth gap or wealth divide. Um, you could also credit this to this like how old the uh, city is because it's not like it's not like it's getting any younger. Um, uh, but the, I'll put it this way: even if even with the ethnic divides that would probably be there, and yes, I've heard definitely that there's probably a sizable um, group of uh, North Africans, is that because of the French welfare state and how it is built out, I can't see that see there being much in the way of massive wealth inequality, particularly in the fact that they wouldn't even know if, if they wouldn't even know where to red- lead line if they could. Because you just can't collect that data, so right, right, right. Uh, I, right. I would largely suspect that the conditions there are not near as bad as you, what you see here in the United States. And then, um, geography. As far as... Let's, let's yeah. geography. We're at geography. Fi- we are at fifty-three minutes. We got to move this tub. So, okay, that's right. okay. That's probably going to be the longest possible section. Okay. Uh, so our next question is: What is the geography that empowers or Harms France. Okay. Um, this section's pretty straightforward. So, northern France is largely part of the northern European plain. This is everything that empowers northern Germany and all of Poland and most of Russia. The difference between France and most of other Europe is that half of France, uh, the northern part of France, or I'm sorry, the northern part of France is part of that plain, but the other parts of it is a lot more hilly. It didn't get scraped up in the uh, the glacial advances and like some other places did. And so um, their geography both empowers and hurts them as far as topography. The northern part where actually Paris is and where the like the Champagne region and whatnot, it's a lot better for building out a modern nation state. And then you can kind of like him or him yourself into the periphery, which is the area that used to be Aquitaine and then to get into the pyramids where you can defend from the south. So the Spanish have never, ever gone north, and the French really have to struggle to go south. Uh, you have the Alps to the to the south and southeast uh, that will keep you out of Italy. And so, basically, it's really easy to, once if you hunker in to these areas, which the French have done very, very successfully, remind you that a third of, Fran- or a third of Switzerland is French, is that the long and the short here is that the French 
don't have to police these area. They are French and thus are part of that whole like ethnic cadre. Um, so what does that leave? In every direction is either, okay, let's just go down the compass. You have directly north, you have Britain, but it's, you know, the English Channel, which is not exactly navigable in, in any kind of ease. So if you have a boat, you might be pretty good, but that requires a navy, which navies are expensive. We'll further that by going uh, northwest and west is the Atlantic Ocean, same problem. When you get more into southwest and west, that's basically Spain, you have to cross the Pyrenees. And Spain has a very similar topography as southern France, but the difference here is that where southern France is very temperate in its climate, Spain is very semi-arid. And so Spain is actually even worse, but we're not talking about Spain. Directly south is the Mediterranean Sea. If you have a navy, it's great. If you don't have a navy, it sucks. Southeast, a bit of the Mediterranean Sea, but this is where we start getting into more like the Italian periphery, whether it's Corsica, Sardinia, and then Italy itself. Obviously, that's more in the east as well, but when we get to the east, it's where we get a cutoff. We have the end of the Alps, and then we have into the North European plain, which is east and northeast is Germany, Belgium. And that's the major axis of advance that we've seen for the last 150 years is that basically the Germans and the French love to just walk on this part of land at each other and get at each other's throats. This is the only major geopolitical challenge that the French have as a direct confrontation is that they literally are on the border with Germany, which is their main geopolitical rival. Now, the other part I want to add, add here is that that all of that oceanfront property is both a hindrance and a... Uh, a boon to them because it means that another naval power has to get to them. They can't, you know, so it's either Britain or maybe a really, really big Italy, but more often than not, it's no one else and they can't physically touch you without a massive Navy. Now this is bad for the French because they actually have to, if they do have a naval competitor, they have to police a lot of shoreline. Just think of how many Cardinal correction, Cardinal corrections on the compass that I just covered. It's at least four of the eight that they have a coastline to guard at. And the worst part is, is that it's not all part of the same system. You have the English Channel, which is largely connected to the Atlantic, which is good. You can just sh sell stuff in a, the period of a day. But getting all the way down to the Mediterranean is about a, was it, about three to four days trip, which means that you are a, at a military and strategic disadvantage for doing so. The French have a trouble putting enough ships in the water and to maintain a solid security. And this is why the British will usually beat them. So that is the outer line. Now talking about inter internal France, we, we are talking about the North European plain. That's the, the Northern part of the country. It's doing pretty well. The Southern part of the country is more hilly, more mountainous. We talk about that. The climate is uh, oceanic temperate, which is a little bit better than Britain's give you a great example of this this is largely like like southern arkansas or northern louisiana it's not that hot it's not as hot because it's more subtropical but what it is is that it's got kind of a constant stream of humidity and water that is dumped out through rain and um, precipitation and so you can grow quite a lot of crop throughout all france and it's not too terribly hard to get around with france on a river there's certain air zones that you can do it. There's certain zones you can't. They're able to build out dams and hydro or hydroelectric facilities where they needed to, um, to make it where you can move up and down the rivers as needed. So on a general level, I would give like France's geography, like a B grade. It's very defensible. It is quite adapt to building a modern nation state. Probably not as good as Germany's building out of state, but way better at defending it. Um, the other side of this, though, is that they're literally able to be attacked from every direction of the compass. The problem with it is, is that, unless it's, I'll largely just exclude Spain here, is that every direction of the compass except south or, or southwest is that somebody in the neighborhood is strong enough to, to get at the French, whether that be the British or, if you will, by extension, the Americans or whether you say the Italians or the Germans, somebody is a rival to be reckoned with. And that's a problem for France. So 
that's their geopolitics in a nutshell as far as their geography is that they just they have options but they also have um what's the word here that i want to use they have more challenges than a lot of their neighbors will i would say that germany has more but that's a whole other conversation into itself which we'll talk about germany one day so any follow-up questions on the geography before we get to the future of france um quick question a uh, big part of france and the modern french state is they're uh, reaching out to their former colonies uh, how does the geography of those places affect French geopolitics? Because that's largely the theater where you're probably going to see French op- the French operating into the future. Yeah, uh, yeah the geopolitics of, of, of West Africa is bad. Um, it really is good for the French because basically all you need is a boat. And you can sail up onto the, the North African coast and everything was within largely 20 miles of the coast, except for some enclaves here and there that are further out into the Sahara. That makes it really, really easy for the French to come in and police the area and control what they want to control. It doesn't, the cost is nothing nearly as what it is for policing other areas that are very in depth. The, the bad side of this is, is that that makes for areas that are very easy to control, but they're very innately unstable because they don't build out economies of state of, of scale. And so you have to make deals with this little ruler and this little ruler and this little ruler and this little ruler. And this is why we have the different colonies that are Morocco and Algeria and Tunisia. Um, if, if some of you are aware of the strife that's going on in those areas, uh, Morocco is having a secession uh, crisis with the lower part. I believe it's called Mantarina. Western but Sahara. Yeah, um, they're, they're, they're trying to break away because they're not really connected to Morocco in any major way, shape, or form. Um, Algeria actually has a bit of a problem to where they have the coastal cities on the um, the sides like Oman and Algiers, but then you, there is one core in the more continental part that actually has an area, and I can't remember the, the city, but it is like a political system separate from the coastal area. And so they have a problem where they don't get along. Uh, Tunisia is largely just all worked around what used to be former Carthage, and so they're not terribly hard to deal with. But the the big people here in this region is the Algerians. They That's where most of the oil that they're going to have to go out and touch is. That's who they'll be largely interacting with or will be priority number one. It's good and bad for them. I'll put it that way. All right. Ryan, if you got anything. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, if I had to talk about anything on the uh, geography section, I was going to ask you about what what their relations with. Um, I, I know I, I know it's not as contested today, but Western Germany, a.k.a. Rhineland, right, um, used to be very highly contested as far as who owns it. Do you think it'll play any um, sort of effect in future French geopolitics? Actually, I or do. Not? But th- this is more of a long story short, and um, we'll get so, this will be in the future. Okay, okay. If yeah. we're if this is gonna be a future thing, then we can segue into the future. So yeah, sure. Uh, so Justin asked the question. We'll just start with that. Okay. Give me one moment. Yep. It's basically what what is the future of France, start. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, I was fucking with my mic. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. What is the future outlook of France? Future of outlook of France is largely positive. Like, if just give it a grade, it's probably looking like a B. It's very positioned well to deal with a like a new neo imperial age. The problem that it has to deal with is that it will, um, it's going to have to figure out what directions it wants to go. North Africa is probably a pretty solid choice. It will probably go there first. But one of the big things that it's going to, um, it's going to have to deal with is that it's going to have to deal, if if you have an area that is neo-imperial, where there is no NATO, or there's a NATO in collapse, and a European Union collapse, is that you're going to have these people called the Germans that are not going to sit idly by. And so they're not going to have a lot of time to act on their priorities list. It's literally going to have to be bang, 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 bang. And let's just be honest here, government doesn't usually work that well, especially the French government. So what very well could happen, not saying it is, but while they look really, really good on paper and they look like they'll be probably the biggest European success story, 
is that what will probably happen is, is that as Europe falls apart over this decade, France will say, all right, cool. We have to go look after our own interest here. Send the Navy and a couple uh, foreign legion detachments down in Algeria. We'll secure our oil. We'll build relations with them. And in the meantime, all of a sudden a Germany that sees the writing on the wall starts rearming. Now, keep in mind something here. And yeah, I'm going to quote Zion again, but hey, whatever. Germany in 1934 was a country that was in destitution, recovering from the hyperinflation and the Great Depression. In 1940, it was invading France. This is the Germans. They can plan. They know how to function and operate. And right now, they're still in the demographic area where they know they have people that are highly technical skilled in a large section of the workforces where they could easily switch from building automobiles to building tanks. And they could absolutely do that in five years. So the question is, is that well, what will, will the French respond in a constructive, in a constructive way if that kind of happens? And I'm just going to say bet on it. If their political system is better, where they actually have somebody who is more in charge, and I'm just going to actually say this, if it's someone who is center right or center left, like a Macron, they're probably screwed because they usually aren't that good at getting the political gravity where they need it to be. But if it's somebody that's far more right or far more left, they will probably take those more authoritarian principles and they'll be able yeah. to eat, eat together I mean, a more cohesive core. Uh, can I, uh, sorry, we can, we can hear you, Radif. Anyway, um, they'll probably be able to work together one of these more, far more cohesive cores that will make them far more politically and economically viable and also militarily. It will be a more well-functioning machine. And because of that, decisions can get made, things can get done, and things will happen in France. So, basically the question is, when does the shit hit the fan? If it happens in this year or the next year, look at France going to crap. If like Le Pen wins or like Le National wins in the next election, and that is next year in 22, and I'm pretty sure it's like November, right? So we're ways out from this. But if that if it happens after that, assuming that the more extremist authoritarian metrics can actually start putting something and gelling something together you might see a France that is very, very capable of getting things done and it just has nothing to fear, but everyone has to fear it. And if anything, actually, if, if Le National would were to, were to win, it would probably be the death nail in the European Union and NATO because they would actively say, we're leaving. Very similar to what the Italians are doing right now. And so that's what I expect, is that largely as a, like, on paper setting the stage, setting the chessboard. They've got a lot of pieces. They're able to use their, like they have, I'm sorry, they have a lot of pieces and they have a lot of easy moves they can make in the opening, in the opening. But there's definitely challenges that are going to be ahead. And if they don't operate in a constructive and well-to-do manner, it will probably come back to bite them. Because let's just be honest here, the people right next door, we call them the Germans, they know how to operate in a very effective manner. They plan, they strategize, and is even in their worst time, the Germans have never really been that disunified. Once they make a decision, it's go time. And if the Germans get the drop on the French, the Germans will win that war. Okay. Um, that's... That's the amount of questions I wanted to ask. Justin, do you do you have any follow-ups or? Um, yeah, I got a quick follow-up. So you talk about how France has to make has a limited time frame in which to make their opening moves, and they have to act decisively, or else it might spell disaster. Yep. Um, what do you think are three of the main things that France will likely do that have the best outlook for them? Uh, you mentioned moving into North Africa being move numero uno. Uh, yep. But what do you see after that? Number one is Algeria, um, which is what, what I got to. They just need to secure their oil and particularly their liquid natural gas. Uh, that's the thing they need to secure. They need energy, right? You can't turn on the lights. You don't have a country. Number mm -hmm. number two is that they need to figure out what kind of relationship they're going to have with the United States. 
Now, you can do these two at the same time, but it needs to be decisive. Um, it is very likely and possible that the French, particularly if it was a more nationalistic government, could have a very anti-American stance. Americans aren't actually all that liked in France, believe it or not. While we do have like some communal bonds and that we cultural exchanges that we kind of look at each other as brethren, mind you that this is the same kind of relationship that they have with the English. And so what is possible here is that if a France looks to itself in its own destiny, it could very much see a United States that might raise an objection to something they were doing as a very big enemy or a rival that they would have to deal with. And so those relations could go very, very sour very, very quickly. However, if France moves decisively and says, hey, look, United States, look, you guys are looking at it for yourself. That's cool. That's great. Do you mind if we take care of our own shit over here? If it if they have some statesmanship to push them into a level where they can at least keep the Americans off their ass, they will largely probably succeed. That's step two. You can do it at the same time as step one. But it's going to have to be decisive. It's going to have to be quick because, let's just be honest here, if the Americans decide to supply somebody who the, the French don't like with some arms or uh, just decide to sanction them for some event that happens, whether they go into Algeria and invade it, what would just basically boil down to is that um, the Americans would ruin the French day, or at least slow them down in a way that would make the, everything harder for the French. Step three is they're going to have to figure out what to do with Germany, because there is no way in hell in a, in a world that is collapsing with the end of the European Union NATO that Germany is going to sit on its hands. Let's just be honest here, right? The Germans are a very capable people. They are a very industrious people. They only need to make a decision on what they're going to do, and they'll do it. And so either they're going to have to go into a direct confrontation with the Germans, and if they get it early enough, they'll win, but if they get it later, they're more likely the Germans would win. The long and the short of that conversation is this. They either can engage the Germans in a knockdown drag out fight. I already said which way that will go depending on what that criteria or they can make some kind of arrangement. I'm not going to say that's guaranteed, but it actually is possible because the French and the Germans right now have had a very, very good relationship. I don't know what happens if there's a more nationalistic approach, but right now, it looks like the, the French want to look south and the Germans want to look east. And as long as that actually stays the norm, they can actually pull themselves into a mutual alliance for a time to say, look, we're not going to fuck with each other and they can actually gain from each other. Let's be honest here. While the French military industrial complex is built out and capable, it doesn't build some of the best stuff, Right. Or it's literally neck deep in the German one as well. Eurofighter Typhoon as an example. Let's just be honest here. The Leopard's better than the the (laughs) Clerk. Anyway, what I'm getting here is this. Is that there is actually a number of reasons that we haven't seen in geopolitical history where the Germans and the French might actually just say, you know what? You suck, but everyone else sucks more. Let's tag team this. Because it's not horribly hard to say, hey, look, France, you've got the Navy, you know, go get our oil because we there's enough oil in Algeria and particularly if you want Nigeria, if they want to hit both at the same time to supply both the Germans and the French at the same time does require a bit of a change for the Germans, though. There's a big reason they're looking east, Um, but it is possible. So we'll see what happens. Usually, if you want to just figure on everything going to shit, just figure they go to war. But I do not table the possibility for a second that the Germans and the French can actually have some kind of an agreement. Okay. And you mentioned that this kind of harkens back to the history of France. But in Napoleon's time, he did a terrible job uh, breaking up the bi- his biggest enemies, right? And France has that issue where they have a bunch of big enemies surrounding them. Um, he didn't break up his enemies and then didn't make allies out of doing that, which largely hurt him in later wars as, you know, the exhaustion of war got to France. Uh, what type of allies do you think France would reach out to, even if they do take a nationalistic approach? Because I feel like 
you know, in the modern world, you can't just go it alone. Or maybe the United States would be one of the few nations that could really do that. Uh, I, I don't see France being that large. I don't see the French looking out to the Americans in a really positive light. Like, they might be able to, like, have, like, some kind of mutual understanding, but that's about the best I see that going. The peoples that I'm looking that the French will actively try to ally with in a neo-imperial world, number one is the Dutch. Ironically enough, I think they're going to, they're going to want to split Belgium. Number two is the Russians. Because they are literally the, basically the other pole of Europe, right? Nothing that the Russians want screws with the French. Nothing what the French want screws with the Russians. And they all have mutual enemies in the middle of the continent that they can actually pick a fight with at the same time. So, anyway. Yeah, the long, the long and the short here is that... Um, at least for what I see is that remind you that the the people the French people definitely learned after um, Napoleon to take apart their opponents because during both world wars the French were actively trying to dismantle Germany um, it was actually other people that said hey like let's try to keep Germany together as some kind of entity the French wanted to split it up into like two or three countries each time so on that note I think that largely wraps up France. Does anyone have any further questions on the future of France? Real quick, or... Nope. Um, I'm good. No, I think I'm good. All right, so France will definitely be one of the highlight reels to, in the coming era. I definitely expect that. Um, but when everything goes to crap, which everyone in the chat is asking me, I'm not sure. I would expect that everything goes to crap this decade, for sure. But I can't tell you if that's like a 2022 or a 2028 thing yet. There's a certain things that I am looking at that I would say is actually probably closer. And I would say that if anything, if you see Le National gain political power in France in this next coming election next year, bat down the hatches because that will probably be the thing that tears it all apart. If that is not the case, it could be more the end of the decade. There's a th We've talked about this a number of times, about all the things I see coming down the pipe that could tear the world apart, from the collapse of the shipping industry to the collapse of world finances to neo-nationalism. All of these things can hit. I don't know which one's going to come first because I thought the shipping industry was going to go to crap in 2019 when people started shooting tankers. I don't know how it didn't happen. So I've always, I've already kind of been a little wrong. Now I would say it's only a matter of time before somebody does that again. And that goes off the wheels. But until COVID's probably largely over, no one is going to make a bold, decisive move, particularly in Europe, because Europe is not handling COVID all that well. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I've been Tiberius D. Thank you for this extended episode of France. I don't think we're any going to get anywhere near this time limit. We actually beat the China episode on france yeah <laughs> go us uh i thought it, it, it's basically french history there's so much french history that i covered in there but um so um but anyway uh, i've been tiberius d i've been joined by justin and radif we'll be talking about another um i will i'll, I'll be talking about um other episodes coming up in the future uh, the revisit of Britain is on the list covid is on the list india is on the list pakistan's on the list it's a lot of stuff coming out. Be sure to not have to mention Go ahead. COVID with a special guest. Yeah. COVID episode. I mentioned that. Watch out for that. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't mention that. Well, we've got a lot of stuff in the pipe. I am sorry that last week didn't have a lot of stuff. I apologize for that. I just had an incredibly busy week. It was father's birthday. It was just one thing after another and it's tax season. So right now I need to like put my taxes together and ship that all off and be done with it. I'm going to try try to get one ep or sorry three episodes a week or at least two episodes a week i failed last week i apologize but that is what we're shooting for here i just got to get everybody here anyway thank you all very much for joining us if you want check out my twitch follow it and it will let you know when i'm streaming i'm sorry i'm not been consistent at all regarding this but twitch is going through a massive overhaul in that community and it's going to take some time before we're back to any kind of standard and we're not 100 percent sure what we're going to do yet we do record this show there but it doesn't mean that that's going to be the same 
if you do like you want to see the video version of this these guys didn't have their cameras on at all this whole episode thank you very much sorry i'm ugly but it's not my fault you can check out this episode on youtube every time you can see my beautiful face in this absolutely horrible uh looking um homeless beard that i've got going on here because it's just hey, hey i'm the one who coined that term ah. only i can say that about you whatever anyway <laughs> But, okay, if you actually want to contact me, if you have questions, either you can drop it in the comments of um, the YouTube, sh or of the YouTube. that's where a lot of them have been, but you can contact me on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. I'm easy to find, Tiberius D. We'll catch you later on Geopolitics with Tiberius D. Signing off.